Good afternoon. Hi, everybody. My name is Mara Jill Herman, and I am the associate producer here on Communion. And thank you so much for staying this afternoon to learn a little bit more about the making of this incredible play. We just spent a good 65 minutes learning about the wonderful Matthew, this amazing human, music teacher, generous soul, and Broadway veteran. Yeah. <laughs> and you can read more about him in the program. And I also have the distinct pleasure of introducing you to Ross Murray, who is here representing GLAAD Media Institute. He is the vice president of this organization. They do incredible work, so thank you for being here. GLAAD provides activist, spokesperson, and media engagement training for the LGBTQ and allied community members. Ross is also the founder and director of The Naming Project, a faith-based camp for LGBT youth and their allies. Ross is also the producer of Yes! <laughs> Jesus Podcast, a faith-based and sexuality-affirming podcast that believes you don't have to pick between gay and God. And finally, but not not at all limiting his incredible bio. We only just have so much time. <laughs> <laughs> he is a consecrated deacon in the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America with a specific calling to advocate for LGBTQ people. So thank you so much for being here. I'll let you, you. take it away. Thank you. And thank you, Matt, one more round of applause. Thank you, Matthew, for sharing your story and putting out here. <laughs> Um, so there are some pre-written questions. This is very conversational, and I will also share, Matthew and I go back a long way. We met a long time ago. Um, and, but uh, how many of you knew the story that this, uh, this play was based on before you came in the room? Most everyone, yes, maybe most, most. Um, okay, and one of the things that I, I recall, I, I mentioned I work with GLAD, a big portion of my work is working with um, religious people and religious communities. At one time I was all religion all the time. Things change and you are more than that too. But I also remember 2021 having text conversations and video calls with you with some other organizations and um, launching the petition, the New York Times piece, like all that stuff kind of happening and realizing, you know, I'm a little removed from it. So I, I, I kind of get to have that outside of perspective, but now how very, personal and traumatic and painful this experience is every time it happens, and then turning that into a piece of art. <laughs> so can you talk about the process of going from what I remember a conversation like sure. in 2021 yes. to now getting to put together a 65 minute show that tells this story in its entirety with no less passion than there was then? Um, thank you for that beautiful introduction. Um, it was obviously very difficult mm -hmm. and uh, when you're trained as an actor and as an artist who performs who writes who expresses themselves the truth of who themselves are and you, you work on those I mean I'm in my late 40s at this point so you work on those muscles year after year after year project. Mm -hmm. it's like it becomes antithetical to who you are if you don't do that mm -hmm. so when an institution presents you with a document that says, with a non-disclosure agreement, with a non-disparagement agreement, it was very corporate, it was 10, 11 pages long, and, and says, if you sign this, then you'll get this much money, but you can't say anything. I mean, there was a moment, of course, where I was like, well, what am I gonna do to eat, pay the rent, you know? Right. Um, but we were luckily in a, in a position where I did have like an emergency fight, you know, I was, we were able to make it work, and, and I said, you know, it goes against every bit of myself to, because I knew if I didn't say anything, I live in these neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, Rowan would laugh with me and say, well, we can't go two blocks, you're like the king of the neighborhood, everybody, because I, I must have known, this, this story must have affected like over a thousand people, whether it's children or parents or families, parishioners, people I live in my neighborhood. So I can't walk and then people are gonna be like, what happened? I mean, yeah, thank you. And I couldn't say anything, are you kidding me? So I knew that I had to say something, but I also knew that I had experience with storytelling. Mm -hmm. 
and all those muscles were built. So um, it just naturally was a story to tell and it evolved over the course of a year. And I, I would write things and then put it away for a couple months because it, it hurt too much. Yep. And I wanted to be as authentic as possible. So you want to feel all the feelings when you're writing, right? I put it away, put it, pick it back up. And eventually um, I sent it to my director, Kira Simring, who's the artistic director of the Cell Theater here in, in Manhattan. And we had worked together before. She had initially seen it, I had written it as a play with multiple actors. Okay. And then she read it and she said, what about as a solo show? My husband said the same thing and it just evolved into what you see today. <laughs> was, it, was it therapeutic getting to like revisit it enough to be able to be able to tell the story, step back from it, revisit? Like even now, is this therapeutic to share it? Every time. Okay. Every time it is. Um, for sure. And to approach it and go away from it, I mean, you know, people I know, people who aren't artists who just write for themselves, you know, um, this is no different than that for me. Only I mean, now. You're so, I mean, one, the fact that you have the gift and the talent to take something and turn that into a story and a piece of art too, I think it's also a rare combination. I think there's some folks that are in this situation that don't know what they do with that. Well, you know, it's a very isolating experience, not only um, being told to not talk about it, and not only being told that you're fired and you're not part of your communities, but doing a solo show is also a very isolating <laughs> experience. Um, so I made sure, and I had done one before, so I made sure that this time to uh, surround myself with people sooner rather than later. Mm -hmm. Would you read it? Would you, would you edit for me? Would you help put it on its feet? Mm -hmm. So that helped a lot to have those hands mm -hmm. double. Um, so one, in, in my position, I have, I've described myself this way, part of my job, it is very perverse, but I've developed a specialty of working with people who've been fired from Catholic institutions because they got married. Um, it's weird, yes. Um, and I will say, partly because I work at GLAAD, I hear a lot of traumatic stuff, and I also get very like action-oriented, so I have to like pause and say, that was horrible, and now here's what we're gonna do about it, right? Like, instead of just jumping into the what to do. But every time this happens, it's personal, it's personally traumatic. And the other thing for me is always, it's always, I feel like the story always ends up being so local. And the frustration has always been, does anyone ever see the bigger picture, right? New, New Age Ministries try to keep track of this. They've kept track of over 100 firings that they're aware of over since 2007, which is what they're aware of. Not the ones who did sign an NDA or did sign a severance okay. package. Um, and, um, and I always look and say, your story happens in Queens and it's so impacted because you live there, you're part of the community, you're still close to the church, you're still close to the school. It happens in Indiana, it happens in Seattle, it happens in Asheville, North Carolina. Um, and we kind of get these in localized individual stories. And one of the things I'm really excited about, you're talking about bringing this outside the, the boroughs here, is what's the way that we aggregate this up to say, there is an actual problem um, and a shortage of people with gifts and skills that are being actively purged from a church that says they want them, but also doesn't want them at the same time too. And, and I think a story like this has a way of doing that, both through a very personal lens, but also ends up being relatable because I have a hunch in other places, other cities, people would say, oh, I know someone that happened too. Mm. I don't know, have you, have you gotten to be in contact with other people who have gone through a similar experience? You know, there was one, one person that I was in touch with, um, and we lost touch. Um, I tried to be in touch several times, but uh, it wasn't reciprocated. Maybe at some point it would be again. Um, I think it was just too painful, and I think that the person wanted to move on. Mm -hmm. It was like, this chapter is over. And I'm done. I think there were some legal things that they were attempting as well, and they failed. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe they're appealing. I don't know if they are, you know. But I haven't. It's difficult to find those people to reach out directly to them because it makes you want to be become more insular. It could be a very like in the show we have um, that media montage, mm -hmm. and and I stand the way we blocked it in the show. I stand and I watch it and. And we build to this crescendo up to this point where there's like tinnitus in your ear and you hear that and 
And it brings back a lot, because I remember at the time, I was spinning so many plates and talking to you and the media trade, and I'm somebody who's used to saying it to their faces, you know? Um, and used to even being on camera, because actors do that. And even then, it was overwhelming. So you can only imagine that, that for people who can't do that, mm -hmm. that they need um, the support or don't want to do it. So I feel as though I have those skills and I have the ability to tell the story and to um, express it to people, to the world, to the larger world. And so it feels like a call in to me, and so I'm stepping into this. It seems, if I can phrase it, it seems like a ministry to me. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, that was, that was one, of the, one of the points that we wanted to get across with, with communion, mm -hmm. um, that you're called a minister and you deny it. You deny that you're a minister because legally that's the way to get around it. And when in actuality you are a minister newly resurrected. Mm -hmm. There's like, um, I think about this often, there is calling and there is ministry as a technical legal term. And then there's calling and ministry as a calling from God that may be in concert with a larger institution, but if that institution is getting in your way, mm -hmm. then we just figure out how to work around them because the ministry still has to get done mm -hmm. in some way. You're a minister. I am. Yeah. You are, and your process getting to that point, did you have a rocky road or was it smooth for you? Um, no, very rocky. I mean, yeah. I've gone through some experiences here. Yeah. Um, and I wouldn't be an advocate, I wouldn't be a glad, I wouldn't be here today if that didn't happen. I was 24, part of some youth traveling music ministry, visit churches and do programs in their basement kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And getting kicked out of that organization made me realize how much we had to, how much work there had to be, had to be done for that level of acceptance. And which was funny because it got me into in the Lutheran Church, which is a bit more democratic than the Catholic Church, a process for how, like, oh, we have these policies in place, we'll figure out how to change those. And it happened individual congregation of parish by parish that kind of, like, bubbled up into what eventually, I wouldn't be a deacon without that policy change. Um, and, and now I'm kind of in my denomination with a healthy level of skepticism about what its limitations are. Okay. And so, and I always feel, I'm, I do really feel that like the institution can be really helpful. It's us, the church, can be us pooling our resources, trying to do ministry, trying to figure out God's calling on earth. But like you said in the play, the institution is not God. Mm -hmm. And we are people trying to figure this out and people that are prone to failure and sin. And so accept that. And then what else can we do to be effective? What else can we do to be helpful? The power of inclusion is, it, it, so I went after it all went down, I was looking for a spiritual home mm -hmm. and I still haven't really found one um, like with construct and stuff, but I went to an Episcopal church in, um, in my neighborhood, mm -hmm. a, little, a little further, it wasn't three blocks, but it was a little further. Mm -hmm. And um, I went there because a friend um, is singing in the choir there and I met their their minister, their pastor, and, um, and he's gay. Mm -hmm. And he had heard of my story, and we were outside, and he um, he put his, he blessed my forehead, and like put his hand on my shoulder. And it was just a, a very moving thing for me. And I said, if, if there's just an ounce of that, what that could mean. I could only imagine if a priest would do that, for publicly do that for me, and bless me. Um, and not, not name me as the catechism says, the Catholic catechism, and I kid you not, it says that uh, homosexual acts are intrinsically disordered, yeah. and it is still part of, part of the catechismal teaching. Have, have, you found places, have you found places of hope? Um, in the people, mm -hmm. um, in doing this show, how many people show up to uh, support me? Um, in my own family with my parents um, who are here today. Um, oh yes, I got wine. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
the way they have stood by me. And I know, like, there's, there's someone who recently told me that their parent, or one of their parents, like, in the show, my mother, we use an audio of her speech at our wedding, mm -hmm. and she speaks, and it's this speech where she publicly welcomes my husband into, into our family. And it's just so sweet and beautiful, and we wanted to use it as a, as a device, but of course, like in my real life, it just means so much. And this person said to me, I never had that. And now my mother is dead, and I will never have that. Mm -hmm. And for some people that it takes a lifetime to realize, to work through the, the indoctrination that occurs when you're an infant, because you don't choose to be baptized as, as a one month year old mm -hmm. and all these sacraments that you make and then you grow up and you realize that you're gay and then you realize that the church is calling you a second class citizen and they won't, um, that won't afford you the same milestones and the same inclusion and the same celebration and the same love that so many people are afforded. Um, so the hope for me to get back to that uh, initial thing is the fact that people have woken up to that, that even that with the synod in the Catholic Church that's happening right now, right. that they are using more, they have changed their language, that they're not saying people who, who uh, are same-sex attraction, they are naming it as LGBTQ mm -hmm. plus individuals. And that seems, that's a small change, but it's also significant, it's weird, it's, it, it, language it's, is a big yeah, thing. Yeah, it's a huge deal, Yeah, because not identifying it. It's a snail's pace. Yeah. But yes, not identifying it versus actually identifying it um, is a step, at least it's a step forward. Yep. Um, so is it a huge ray of sunshine? <laughs> no. But you know, when you get a flashlight at least, mm -hmm. you take it. Yeah, I, I'm glad you brought up the synod process, the synod on synodality, the weirdest name thing I've ever heard. But, um, yeah. <laughs> um, for Lutheran synods are like little geographic territories. That's also what's confusing mm -hmm. to me too. But um, I what is the synod for people who may not know? Yeah. So this is my as a non-Catholic. Here's yeah. my understanding. So normally a synod, a synod of bishops, is bishops and cardinals talking to each other about the future of the church and the ministry and how they're going to work together. One of the things Pope Francis has done is created a process that has opened that up in a much more significant way. So over the past year, year and a half maybe. Um, it was a listening process, and it was an instruction to every diocese of like hold listening sessions, and people that were inside the church and outside the church, and like anyone was supposed to be able to come. And um, I talked to some people that were making sure that LGBTQ people were going to show up and going to be part of these sessions and going to be. Uh, and then, of course, I love to work a process. Um, so, you know, my question is if that gets said in Lincoln, Nebraska, is that going to level up through a diocese into a bigger into Or will it get lost in the yeah. shuffle? Or do we just say, yes. Uh, right. Which, so where we are now, that listing process is closed and we are on the cusp of having a global delegation. I think it's a one per diocese. Please so correct me on this. We'll be gathering in October to basically sift through all of those diocesan reports and start to put that together into mm -hmm. something bigger. So it's like a, um, and, you can see this, LGBTQ is still, stuff still is in there. Yes. Um, violence is still in there. Mm -hmm. Conversion therapy, um, uh, laws that criminalize LGBTQ people in other countries, shows up in various places. And Pope Francis appointed several, more than a handful of allies. So out of a hundred and something, there's at least a few. And of course, again, my concern is, you are a few people among several hundred. Yeah. Will this keep getting leveled up, and how do we keep that going? So that's the synod process where, where we are right now. Um, it's slow, and it's messy, and it's very human, um, and it also is probably, I think, one of the greatest reformation opportunities that the Catholic Church has had in 500 years. Maybe since Vatican II, so not 500 years. Um, but a lot depends on this moment. Yeah. And it depends on the right people getting to say the right things in the right moment. 
Um, which is why I think, even though that kind of diocesan listening process is over, people are gonna be in a conference somewhere, um, that that continued storytelling like this, the continued breaking of non-disclosure agreements, I think will be really important for people to know that. Um, both for how parents treat their children, how people accept one another, what happens professionally at schools and at institutions, um, and maybe, maybe, for changing the future, changing some of the teaching of the church. Um, Teachings and laws have changed in the past. Yep. Yeah. Laws on divorce, laws on convalidations, things have changed mm -hmm. over the centuries. <laughs> But, you know, miracles happen every day. Mm -hmm. And I think it can only happen when it's personal. Um, I don't think data changes people. I think that this. this, right? And you have to go through that emotional arc with people, too. Yes. Um, this is, I do a lot of media training, and it's a lot of, like, you got to bring, and most people are not actors, so they don't get this. You like you have to bring them through this whole emotional journey. So when I've done this with other Catholics, I like tell us why you loved this school and why they loved you, and then talk about what that meant to sort of have that taken away, not just from you but also from the community, um, and how to do the kind of storytelling that you're doing over the course of an hour. So if I could tell you too that not only have I made this into a play, um, but there was a, a woman. Uh, a master's degree candidate at the School of Visual Arts here in Manhattan. Okay. And she reached out to me because she saw my article in the New York Times and she said, could I make your story my master's thesis Ooh, for okay. social documentary? And I was honored and I met her and I said, absolutely, okay. let's do it. Um, and Is that the film that's mentioned in your bio? The film which is screening literally across the street from here on 23rd Street. <laughs> and there's this School of Visual Arts here. It's, it's screening next Friday. Okay. Um, Friday, September 29th, I believe, at 5.30. But there's also a live stream available, okay. available for that. But the reason that what you said made me think of that is because in the movie, I'm interviewed and Rowan is interviewed, but also people from the communities mm -hmm. are interviewed. And they were so um, involved and so emotional and so the testimonials that they offer they didn't need any training as right, far right. as like, they, I mean, they were, they were beautifully expressive. Um, and the impact that I think that can have as a documentary that this piece can have, because you're right, that's how you change hearts, when you touch your heart to somebody else. And that's mm -hmm. a big reason why I'm doing this now, as an actor and as a writer. Yeah, yeah. It's almost like, I said, people clutch their pearls and go, oh, I didn't know that still happened. Right. And then you say, it does. Yes. And then you follow up with, and here's what we're going to do about it. Mm -hmm. That's sorry, that's me being like the activist and how I think. Mm -hmm. This is where my mind goes when I talk about stuff like this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, we need your work. So, um, are there? So, have you? I want to know what your relationship with, with faith is like now. Um, I mean, I obviously believe in God. And I believe in a bigger picture, and I believe in, in like, um, all this would not have happened so seamlessly if it wasn't for, like, a lot of guardian angels on my shoulder, you know what I mean? However you may want to say that, um, there's definitely a bigger picture, and I just trust in that. As far as doctrine and dogma, I'm very leery of yeah. that. Um, but, you know, like this, the play says, the church isn't God, God is in the people. Mm -hmm. And I find a lot of um, a lot of fulfillment in those relationships and with my family and in cultivating friends. And in and looking to the universal teachings that are present in so many of the great religious traditions of the world. Um, it's really universal. You know, one of the beautiful things that was at my school, there was a, a big pinwheel of it was like a pizza pie chart. And it said, in a Catholic school, it said Catholic and Presbyterian and Buddhism and the Tao and like all these different faiths, Hindu. Um, and at the center it said, love one another. Mm. 
And like how I say in, in the play, where the principal gets frustrated and says, isn't that what we're supposed to be teaching here? Mm -hmm. Because that's what he was hoping that the hierarchy of the church would remain plugged into. Um, I'll tell you that the letters that I wrote, I mean, it's very been, it's been condensed down in the show, but I wrote very long letters and I, I implored them. I said, the impact that, that this firing, this termination, should you choose to go through it? Because, you know, just because you have religious liberty doesn't mean that you have to exercise it. Mm -hmm. And if you choose to exercise this, the fallout from this is going to be huge. And they did, and it was, but maybe it's the waves that are necessary to make um, I think so. Make change. I think so. For inclusivity. Okay, this is like a two-parter question, but um, okay. has anyone from the hierarchy come to see this yet? No. Okay. You know. Um, I mean, I'm not shocked at that answer. No, because <laughs> some, some teachers from, the, from my school okay. have come, and there was a gentleman here yesterday who, out of the corner of my eye, looked so much to me like um, the character that fired me. Okay. That character had glasses in real life, and this person did not. I'm like, maybe he got like sick. <laughs> <laughs> and he was welled up and tear and moving his like, wiping back the tears in the same way that the gentleman when he fired me mm -hmm. and asked me to turn the recorder off started crying mm -hmm. because I, and I asked him in the in that meeting I said why are you getting so emotional and he said because nobody's really thrilled about doing this. I said, then why are you doing this? Mm -hmm. He said, well, it's the tenets of the church that we have to protect. I kept hearing the words over and over, the Catholic identity. And I said, well, what about the Catholic identity of, of dignity for all human beings mm -hmm. and loving one another? Mm -hmm. um, but they chose to zero in on something else. And you know, it's the idea that you're discriminating against one particular segment of the employee's population. Whereas if they were to be so strict with me, as they were with everyone, the way that they were with me, and they would have to fire every, mm -hmm. every, every, sure. every yeah. non-believer, every Jew, agnostic, every, um, I mean, we had employees in my school who were not Catholic, mm -hmm. um, and anyone who used birth control or wasn't going to church on some days, I mean, mm -hmm. but it's a clearly discriminatory practice that was exercised, right. and hopefully the church is waking up to the fact that you know, this is beyond the pale, and we're, we're doing things that are so unnecessary and cause so much, so unfair and cause so much pain. Is that, so then this is the activist to me. For the people that are in the room here, what do you want them, what do you want them to do with what they've learned today? Oh my gosh. Um, I, I'm a big believer in talking, obviously. So I say that you share this, share this story, but also share how you feel. Like, I think there's, to this day, there will still be sometimes people will say, well, you know, he's gay. And they'll go, whisper the word gay. I'm like, why are you whispering the word gay? I said, there's inherent shame in that. And there's no need for that shame. So I say, if you ever find that yourself doing something like that, just catch yourself and say, there's no need for that because it normalizes a level of inclusivity and it normalizes the possibility that, that we're all human and we all deserve equal treat treatment. Mm -hmm. Not separate water fountains, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. What, um, you talked a little about this at the very end. This might be one of my last questions for you, but um, the, besides what you want people to do with this and to talk and to share their story too, you've mentioned going outside of these walls, going outside of these boroughs, mm -hmm. where, one, do you have plans? Are the, is the play going anywhere? And two, if, what are the dreams? Um, I would start with the dreams because okay. it's all got to start from there. And um, we did this production here at The Cell because um, Kira, my director, had said, we, um, we need to find the language of the piece. I had recordings from meetings that I was referencing and we use audio recordings, recreated obviously, but, and then um, uh, we use projections as well. And they're so interlinked to the storytelling. So now that we have the language of what that is and how it works, um, we want to take it to the next level, which is a production off Broadway. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, there, like I said before, there were so so many angels on our shoulders with getting this. Who knows if that really is the next step? But you know, you you put it out there and then see what happens. 
um, but because a run off Broadway would afford greater visibility and reviews, legitimacy, um, and awards consideration. And if we had that in our back pocket, mm -hmm. or maybe in our front pocket, right? You know, if we had that, it would allow um, for a bigger impact. If people saw what was happening, then a lot of theater gets birthed in New York mm -hmm. and then goes, as they say, out to the provinces, right? Um, and when you have that, you know, we're trying to raise funds for that. We have a GoFundMe mm -hmm. for, uh, for this piece. And whatever people can donate, whether it's a small amount, a large amount, if they believe in the mission of this show, then we will have the funds necessary to propel it off Broadway, to give it the visibility, and therefore, people in Atlanta, or in Wyoming, or Texas, or wherever it may be, in, in other parts of the world. My documentarian was, she was from China, mm -hmm. and she was so moved by my piece because she has, um, she has a best friend um, who is also Chinese who, who tried to commit suicide twice mm -hmm. as a young gay man because he didn't know what to do with himself. And I think that a lot of the condemnation against the LGBTQ plus community stems at its core from religious teachings. Mm -hmm. Not all, but a lot. And if we could open that up for people like him and for people in other areas of the country with a show like this, yeah. I say bring it. Well, and I think you use the word, you, when you describe it, you use the word impact. Glad loves the word impact at Will Stacey. <laughs> I've learned to shoehorn that to every conversation <laughs> that I do. Uh, but it is, I mean, it's very easy to say like, well, of course in New York, this kind of stories like this get told too. And I think you're right, having those stories be told in Indiana and Wichita mm -hmm. and Iowa and Wyoming um, and Nevada, I think also does one help people know and see and understand and realize one, what practices have been going on that they often don't get to hear or talk about or maybe think of as one-offs because they're always, again, always local stories of like, well, remember that happened three or four years ago somewhere. Um, and it starts to give them a picture, not only of the scale, but also, like you just said, the what they can do about that and how they can start talking about what their values are, what human dignity looks like, what human dignity looks like when it's LGBTQ people living their everyday lives, trying to support their families, trying to work, trying to contribute to society too. And I think that's why um, support for this show is really important. Um, and that continued sharing, buzz, getting out there, gaining that legitimacy, helps people to see and know that in a way. And I'm, I'm cynical. You will not get a lot of help from the hierarchy of the church, no matter where you go in that too. And, but I'm also very cynical in that you can use that opposition to your advantage for publicity purposes too. So, <laughs> um, and I'll say this too. This is another weird phrase I say at Glad too. I don't remember if I've said this before. The more traumatic the experience, the better learning opportunity for everybody else. Um, it's horrible to go People through. People watch car accidents on the highway. Yeah. It's the same thing. It's horrible to go I through. Know. And yet people don't understand what's happening until they actually see and witness it and get it mm -hmm. in a certain way. Yeah. Um, which is also why I think it's not only brave and important, but also important that this story gets told in a way that does get outside of the five boroughs, that doesn't just tell the story of the neighborhood in Queens, but also says this can and does happen anywhere, yeah. everywhere. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Those are my <laughs> <laughs> um, well, then I just want to say, and the idea also that in certain areas of the country that um, people are silenced mm -hmm. and teachers are constricted with what they can say um, and that there are certain theater companies you know if they're funding if they're conservative we're gonna do Annie again for the, the <laughs> head time, right we love Annie yes but you know there are other stories that can be told and sometimes that theatrical funding might be from a conservative base and people getting nervous yep. that I would lose my funding and I would do so I think it's even more important in places where it's less likely to happen mm -hmm. if we were able to bring it yep. up so. And, and sorry, I will add one more thing too, because I know this is in our notes back and forth too. I think this story is really important, and I also know that there have been people, organizations that have been working, like there are religious LGBT organizations, several. My camp's one of them, there's lots of them. In the Catholic world, 
I know we've met with Dignity USA right. um, that does that's been doing work now for 40 or 50 years. Um, New Ways Ministry, I cited them earlier. Um, more recently here in New York City, Father Jim Martin and Outreach is a newer conference that's been happening um, that also I think has been, he's one, he's a significant voice. He wrote Building a Bridge and then has sort of like built this conference where people have gathered for the last couple of years. And so you can see this very concerted effort in a lot of different ways to try to offer that mutual support for one another, but also wanting to change the church and the world as part of it too. And I, when I ask you where you find hope, it's in organizations and spaces like those that I often find hope too. We need organizations like that because the fracture that occurs in the life of an individual of faith mm -hmm. who realizes that they're gay and then has to choose between their faith and their truth of how God made them is very unnecessary and very unfair. So that's why I'm holding up a mirror to an institution that I believe with these policies, they do a lot of good things for a lot of people with the poor, etc. but in this regard, um, they're clearly doing more harm than good. Mm -hmm. Thank you for telling this story. Thank you. Thank you. In this moment and then of course exit this space and please talk to other people about these stories and things like this as well thank you thank you everybody for staying thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.